Thank you for attending another in the Expert User Webinar Series presented by TopStep regarding OpenAir. And today's topic is invoicing and credits. What we're going to cover today is what we hope will be a, a helpful, comprehensive um, review of how billing rules are established in a system and how they work with charge stages to control how your financial tracking is happening, the use of the billing code function that you may not be aware of, and of course, how to create the invoice, something that many of you may already know how to do, um, but some features that you may not be aware of. Then we're going to move into retainers. Um, what is the use and when should you use retainers? And compare that against the customer PO and the agreement functionality. Then we're going to go into the credit side of things. How do you handle credits? Um, what's the best way to do a credit to an invoice? And we're going to review the credit and rebill functionality that's fairly new in the open air system. And finally, we're going to end it with some invoicing, customer-facing invoice features that you may or may not be aware of that OpenAir can take care of. So it gives you some um, thoughts as far as whether you should be using your accounting system or the OpenAir system to talk with your customers. So let's jump right into the billing rules and the charge stages. Um, the basic functionality, as many of you know, in the OpenAir system is you create billing rules against projects. Those billing rules do things like change hours on a timesheet into money per hour or per day, fixed fee billing, expense receipts into billable receipts. Um, those rules create basically what's called charges, and those charges are gathered up or captured on a document or a report in Open Air called an invoice, and that invoice then can be sent to the customer or over to your accounting system, so forth and so on. The billing rules actually, when they create the charges, can direct where the charges go in the Open Air system. So even though the basic functionality in OpenAir is to run rules, create charges for invoicing, you can actually create, have the rules create charges that are categorizing the charges in different ways, such as write-offs, prepayments, um, pending funding from a customer. So the charge stages are how you can um, leverage whether something actually gets on an invoice or not. So the basic open air functionality, when you first get the open air system, if you've done no customization to this module, you will by default see two charge stages called open and build. Both of those actually are representative of a charge stage that is blank. There is no charge stage defined. Charges that are sitting in the tab, sub tab called open means they have not been put onto an invoice document. And those that are in the build stage have been put onto an invoice document. It's a very, very basic concept that comes natively with the OpenAir system. Of course, like anything else in OpenAir, there's lots of configuration options you can consider. And this is one of the key areas as you're thinking through your financial cycle and your invoicing cycle, including credits, is how to expand that basic functionality into a more comprehensive control that may align closer to your accounting practices. Uh, things like uh, different charge stages that could hold the prepayment amount for an invoice. Invoices that are generated to the customer, they're paying an amount maybe for a prepaid purchase of hours or a, you know, upon signing invoiced amount. They can go into the prepaid stage, still generate an invoice, but the charges have an extra sort of descriptor or category on it called charge stage. And I'm going to show you why that's important in just a second. Other options for charge stages are, well, what if you don't want the charge to get invoiced? What if you want to keep it as sort of a reporting comparison? A great example here is I fixed price the project, but I want to monetize the time that was spent on it to see if I'm better or worse off having made this a fixed price versus time and material example. So you can actually sort of duplicate your whole billing and invoicing thing, but using the charge stages as controls, you can include or exclude things on reports. Now charge stages are more than just um, sort of a grouping of items. If you're using the projects module in OpenAir, you there's a similar concept called project stages. And if you're familiar with a project stage, it can have a lot of features turned on or off. Charge stages are similar in that it doesn't have as many features, but the features that are available are very important. Uh, besides having a name, you can actually have the charges automatically be excluded from invoicing. This is great for those people who want to keep track of how much money did I have to write off on this project um, because the customer uh, couldn't pay for it or we went over budget 
or uh, it was a credit perhaps. Um, so what am, I, what am I writing off? So any charges sitting in this charge stage called write-off or non-invoiceable or whatever can actually be excluded from invoicing. Because of that, when you go to generate your invoices, and we're going to get into those steps in just a minute, none of these charges will be available. However, they exist in the system. And because they exist in the system, now you can actually include them in a variety of ways on reports. For many of you, you may have heard the term ghost charges. And ghost charges is a way to, um, in some cases, drive time-based revenue while in invoicing on a fixed amount or a milestone basis. And ghost charges typically are excluded from invoicing. But what that also poses is the challenge that if you're using the standard project analysis report in OpenAir, um, that focuses on what have you invoiced. And you, you want to be able to control whether something is included on that report or not. The non-invoiceable items or the ghost charges may be something you want to exclude so you don't look like you're du duplicating um, billing. From a, from a basic reporting perspective in open air. And then finally, we're going to talk about customer POs a little bit later in the presentation, but if this isn't an invoiceable charge, does it actually draw down from a customer PO? Does it draw down from the balance of the funding? And perhaps not, so you can always make sure that those charges are deducted. And if you're wondering where this charge stage value is, it's back in the administration module, and for those of you with the account module still set up, it's under account and the account tab. Um, in the administration version of it, it's under application settings, then invoice settings. And you'll see that there's a charge stage option for con con uh, configuration. For the account module, it's account module, account tab, and then over in the invoice section of the page, you'll see charge stages. And you'll notice that there's nothing defined for open or build. Those don't technically exist as a stage. They come standard with the open air system, and they represent a blank value for a stage. And I'll show you where that's set on the billing rule. As you create uh, charge stages, you can um, identify how they act in the system. Charge stages are actually a pretty powerful tool because not only do they display information in the invoices module in different tabs, it also gives you a great index into creating um, those custom calculations. We've covered this on other webinars. Many of you have custom calculations for your reporting. But the custom calculation feature, should you have the, um, the report filtering option turned on, You'll notice that one of the options that you can filter on is charge stage. So this, uh, you can let your imagination go wild, but you could create brand new reports that say, here's my prepaid amount, here's my um, ghost charges amount, here's my, each of those could be a column on your report versus just subtotaling by charge stage. So you could create custom calculations filtering on this charge stage and generate an entire array of um, accounting related uh, financial tracking reports just by leveraging and uh, dissecting the way the, the charges are tracked into your system. So billing rules, uh, if you're not familiar with where billing rules are in the system, billing rules are associated to individual projects in the system. So let's go ahead and take a look at that and you'll see what I mean about the charge stages uh, as we look at a billing rule for example. So here's a time billing rule uh, in a project. It's under the financials menu. And in the bottom of the form, you'll see that there's an other section. And the other section allows you to set certain, certain things like a charge stage. The value of blank actually means open. Um, you can't set the charge stage to build. That's an automatic process by the fact that you put a charge on an invoice. But you can set it to not invoiceable or pending or prepayment which means anything that this billing rule uh, generates is going to go into a charge stage. Now there's three ways to actually run the rules. And when you first learn the open air system, you, use the most, you learn the most basic way, which is manually, individually, within each project, doing the financials menu, accessing the billing link, and doing the run option. Okay? And unless you only have two or three projects, that may be the way you're continuing to do it. But a much more effective way 
is to use something called a pending billings report, which is under the advanced report area in the system. I recommend using this report simply because it runs the rules across all of your projects, but still gives you the opportunity to review the details before you decide that you actually want to proceed with generating the charges. And if you're not familiar with where this report is, it's actually in the reports module. And it's one of the standard reports that comes with OpenAir, but it's in the Advanced tab because it has special functionality. And specifically, clicking on Pending Billings, the specific functionality is it runs the rules across all of the projects that are included in the report. Now there are some tips on how best to run this report. And one of the tips is um, take advantage of how you've configured your projects with custom fields. Um, the filters that are available uh, for the longest time were limited to standard features in OpenAir, project stage, client, project, and so forth. But now it's been expanded so it natively can include things like maybe region or um, project owner, well, project owner's already been there, but maybe salesperson, um, maybe type of contract. So any custom field that you've created that's sort of a drop-down um, option is going to be available on this pending billings report. So it gives you the ability to actually create um, very specific reports that um, ensure that you're following the billing activity. Um, at a minimum, I see most customers using the project stage filter because the project stage filter basically aligns with when is work signed and when is it being worked on so that I can go ahead and invoice the customer. And typically stages such as um, live or active or in process are the stages that get filtered along with the closed stage, for example, for final invoicing. I always recommend the date range be blank, however, because that picks up anything that's ready to be billed. Um, if you put time limits on your, um, on your pending billing report or even running the rules, you run the risk of missing something that may just be outside the bounds, um, something that was worked on uh, perhaps uh, January 29th this year, which happened to be a Sunday, and you're going ahead and you're starting to run your rules for February 1st to the 28th or 29th. Um, and in fact, being a, a leap year this year, many people may forget there's 29 days in February and run it for J February 1st to the 28th instead of including the 29th. So I like to recommend to leave it blank because there's other ways to control whether something actually does get invoiced, and that's through the invoice creation module. So creating uh, charges ahead of time is, is not, a, not a problem, depending on how you're doing your reporting, of course. Um, other options that are on the pending billing report, we're going to skip over the billing code section for a second because we're going to focus on that in just a second. Um, but there's a currency drop-down. Now the currency will drop to, uh, default to what your uh, standard currency is that you're running with in the system. In my, in my case, it was USD. And for many of you, you may only have a single currency, so this field will not show up. But if you do have multiple currency, there is actually a value on this pending billing report called native. And what that does, it will run, run and generate um, the list of transactions and charges in the currency of the project. So you could have a mixture of euros and U.S. dollars and Mexican pesos and Chinese yen all within the same pending billings report. And last but not least, the um, hide projects with no pending billings. Definitely highly recommended that this always be checked because what happens is um, if you don't check this, any active project in the system will show up in your list, whether it wants to have billing or not. And if it doesn't have anything to bill, it will be a big fat zero. So um, many of you out there have maybe 100, 200 projects, maybe thousands of projects that are active, but you're only billing maybe you know, a 10% of those at one time. So instead of scrolling through pages and pages and pages of zeros, check this box and you'll only get the stuff that you're supposed to be seeing. So let's take a look at the system in, that, in this pending billing report. And you can see in my system I have quite a few additional um, descriptors on my projects. So I could actually say I'm only going to run invoicing for anything that's related to um, our reporting offering and business efficiency offering. And when those are selected and I run the report, it will come back and give me anything that falls into those categories. So take advantage of all that customization that you've done in the system because it may help you with your invoicing cycle. Um, I have multi-currency, so I can pick the value of native, native if I like, but I think all the examples I'm going to show you today are actually in U.S. dollars. 
but you'll see how it actually qualifies it with the with the type of currency you have, and uh, this way you can actually get a mixture of euros, British pounds, and so forth and so on. Now, when you run this rule, you'll notice that it gives me the option to. Um, there's four uh, four projects that can be built. And the reason I know that is because it's coming up and it's telling me that there's a number of billings. And what that means is number of transactions. So if I click into any of these project names, I basically get into the details so I can double check to see how things are going. Okay. And as you look through projects, you can actually decide that this looks good and create the transactions, move to the next project, decide that this looks good, and create the transactions and just keep going until you are expended the whole billing report. Now some of you uh, may be sitting here going, well, I don't really want to have to page through 300 projects. I want to be able just to create it all and fix it if the invoices are bad. Um, there is also an option to do a one-click generation of all of this. So you can run this report against all your projects. It will give you the whole list of projects that want to do some billing. And then if you look down here in the tips area, you may notice a little note that says click here to create 41 billings for the two projects, which happens to be the total of the billings that are listed here in these two rows. So I can opt to actually just click here, confirm I want to create the billings, and it will create it, and there's nothing more I need to do. Now I'm, now I'm ready to start doing my invoicing. Um, definitely something to consider doing after you feel comfortable that the rules are right, and it looks like inf information is being generated, especially those time billing rules, making sure that there's no zeros coming through. If people have like the wrong kind of job code, or they don't have the right rate, or they're not included in the rule, all those kind of things that you may be familiar with. Now one option I didn't mention before I talked more about the pending billing rule is auto bill setting. So there isn't a way in OpenAir to set a project up just to automatically run the rule itself and generate whatever it can generate. Um, before you decide to do those kind of auto bill settings, um, there's a couple of things you have to make sure that you feel comfortable that the rules are set up right, but you also have to consider the impact that you'll have actual charges in the system and what that may do to your forecast and it may do to your reporting in the system. So there are some considerations other than just using this functionality to make invoicing easier, um, whether you should be turning it on or not. But the pending billing report makes it pretty simple to be able to run things across multiple projects and generate things in a, in a quick and hopefully painless way. So let's talk about that billing code field that I actually kind of skipped over as we were uh, generating items. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into the system and get rid of some of those um, open charges that I just created so I can demonstrate this, uh, this next feature. And when you're deleting charges, if you don't already know this, make sure you delete the charge and the project billing transaction, and you're basically resetting the whole billing rule functionality. Okay. So um, when I was actually running that report, there was a section on the report that said billing code filter. So a billing code filter, you notice that it doesn't have any drop downs, it's a free text field. So you know, how does this work and what does it connect to? And what it actually connects to is a field that a lot of people end up just kind of skipping over. They don't see it anymore because they're not using it, or maybe they've even hidden it. And this is a field on the project called billing code. And it's a free text field as well. It only holds two characters or up to two characters. Um, but it's a, a functionality that people can consider using that help you one, uh, in one more way to sort of group or batch invoices based on similar characteristics. You notice that I put a billing code of Q here. And what we've worked with customers on before is um, you know, they have invoicing cycles. You know, the nice thing is when people have invoicing cycles that are every month. At the end of the month, I run my invoices. But not everyone works that way, and in some cases, Certain customers require that you invoice them weekly, and some customers say it's semi-monthly, and other customers are only once a quarter. Um, what about those annual uh, things like our release management offering, which is an annual fee? You know, yes, you can set the rules up to be able to run on a periodic basis, but what if it's a T&M project and you only generate an invoice? Once you, you generate an invoice every quarter, not every month, not every week, just every quarter. 
if you run the rules on a monthly basis and you go to generate invoice on a monthly basis, you may pick that one up by accident and get ready to send it to the customer and realize, oh, it's February. I'm supposed to send it at the end of March. So what you can do is you can use something like a billing code to help you with things like that. Um, other reasons for using billing code is to, to be able to batch invoices that have a similar um, special instruction, such as this group of invoices are per diem, and I have to adjust the expenses manually to make sure they reflect per diem amounts and not actual receipts. This group of invoices requires that I send everything through FedEx, so I have to make sure I print all of these off after I've generated them, put them in a FedEx folder, and mail them to the customer. This set of invoice, you know, see what I'm saying? So they're, the billing codes actually is a way to sort of group related projects or project invoicing activities without having to create a whole other custom calculator or custom field in the system. It's been in the, in the Open Air system for several years. It's just a little known feature. So what you can do is you can establish sort of a billing code structure. In this example here, we set up some things like a semi-monthly meant SM, um, D meant it was a deliverable-based invoicing, M meant monthly, ME meant we're doing it at the end of the month, MM meant middle of the month, so um, the 15th always, not the semi-monthly. So there were different objects that were our policies that were being adhered to with the billing code. So what I did in this example is I went ahead and said, okay, this is a quarterly invoice. So I'm going to pretend it's the end of the quarter, and I want to generate all of my invoices that are quarterly invoices. So when I go to run the pending billings, what I do is I say, okay, I'm only running quarterly invoices this time. I'm not running anything else. And when I run the report, you'll see that this one project comes up versus the four that were coming up before. So if I remove that billing code filter and run it again, here's the four that we were working with previously. But these are all different setups. So let's say I only want semi-monthly reports. Uh, report projects. I get a different one because this is a semi-monthly invoice. So it's very helpful to sort of batch related invoices together based on invoicing policies for the client, for example. The nice thing about the billing code is you can do it through, um, through the creation of charges, but you can also use it when you go to create invoices and it becomes uh, a feature that's available automatically on the new multiple invoice form. Okay? So once you've got these charges generated, and I'm going to go back into the system and generate the charges and then walk you through the two options here for creating invoices. So I'm just going to run this with everything, and I'm just going to click the little shortcut here to generate everything. And now I'm going to move on to the invoice generation. So the invoice generation, of course, is in the invoices module. And under the invoices tab, I get the option to see a new invoice or new multiple invoices. If I do the new multiple invoices, here's the billing codes again. So now, actually, I can generate charges for everything, but I can decide that I want to create sequential invoice numbers batched by give me um, generate all the invoices that are related to semi-monthly billing and it's going to come up with the one that I wanted to generate charges for. So it's a way to sort of group invoices together as you're processing activities. So you're probably very familiar, or maybe you're not, but uh, the, the generation of invoices, you can generate one invoice at a time, um, or you can decide that you want to generate all invoices in a batch. And there are pros and cons to each of these options. So when you create a brand new invoice, just a single invoice, what it gives you the ability to do is view the invoice before you want to generate it. You look at all the gory detail with all the different um, charges on it, and then if you say, yes, that looks great, then you can go ahead and click on Create the Invoice, and it gives you an immediate view of exactly what the invoice is going to look like if you sent it out right now. So that's great. It um, gives you that, you know, that real-time look and feel, and you could submit it right from there and, and have it go off to review and approval. Um, but you don't have the ability to do billing codes. It sort of says, okay, well, if you're looking at everything one by one, then you can know whether you want to generate it or not. And the invoice date is always defaulted to today because you're generating it today. Of course, you can always modify that, but it defaults to today. The differences between that one by one option and the multiple, of course, you know, one by one versus batch. But 
um, what it allows you to do is the only thing you can sort of exclude as far as charges is date control. Because you saw in that form, you get a start date and an end date that you can control what charges to bring in, but you can't control things like only bring in certain types of services or only certain types of expenses. Those, that, that level of detail you can't see until after you've created that batch of invoices. Um, it does, however, provide you a list of the invoices that it wants to generate. So in the case of our example where we do have the four invoices that I can generate, I'm going to remove that billing code, and I say just go ahead and generate them. What it does is it first says, do you agree that you want to generate these four invoices? So at least I get one more step to check before I have to create it. But of course I can't see any of the detail until I actually generate the invoice and then go look at it. The invoice date itself is something that you can set and it will be applied across all the invoices. So you do have that option on the form to set the invoice date and if you're using accounting date, that option as well. We already talked about the fact that it supports the billing code, but then of course if you want to see the way that the invoice looks, you have to go into the invoice afterwards to view the display. So there's some pros and cons on um, using either of these options. It's really, uh, really sort of an efficiency if you're using billing codes. The multiple invoice may be much easier for you to use. Create a batch, submit a batch, and move on to the next one. If you have more um, adjustments that you may have to consider, the inv individual invoices may be the way to go. There's another tab that's available in many of your accounts called Retainers. And if you don't have this turned on, it's something that you can contact Open Air Support to turn on. And what a retainer is, is basically the fact that a customer has actually given you money. That's the intent of using a retainer. And the fact that they've given you money, you want to keep track of the fact that they've given you this money and how are you using that money as you continue to um, deliver services to them in a prepaid activity. So you can actually create a retainer. The limitation of a retainer is something that it's only at the customer level. But as you're generating an invoice, it will ask you, do you want to apply any of the retainer and draw down against the outstanding balance? So an example on the next slide shows how um, a retainer was created against Accenture, for example, for the amount of $5,000. And as we're generating an Accenture project and getting ready to invoice this customer, you'll see that the invoice is for $750, but there's an available retailer balance, retainer balance of $5,000. So I can actually draw the $750 off of this. They won't have any balance on this invoice. They'll just be able to see how much of the retainer you've used when they receive this invoice from Open Air. Retainers are actually, um, as they are compared to customer POs, they, they seem like they're very similar, but the customer PO functionality is more of a promise for funding. It's an official document. It has a numbering system that's issued by the customer. Um, Open Air does support all of that, and we'll talk about that next. Retainers are more of a high level, we're keeping track of it for you, um, thank you for the money and the cash advance, but we're going to keep track of the payment so that we understand whether um, we are running out of your funds or not. So the retainer is more of a, a cash management activity. So customer and POs, uh, customer POs and agreements are uh, a more advanced or a, um, more of a promise to pay funding um, activity. And they are a standalone documents or standalone items in the Open Air system. They're underneath the Application Settings Administration module. For those of you who have the Account module, it's still under the Account tab in the Invoice section. And basically, customer, and PO, customer POs and agreements work in a very similar fashion. They both uh, exist to capture a money amount, an official document number, and a date range. Um, they both have to be associated to the project. When, if you want to use them with a project to keep track of invoicing to a project, so they're very project specific. They can go across projects. Um, depending on other feature functionality you may have turned on, there's conflicts there, but um, they can be associated to projects. And as they're associated to projects, they can also then be associated to billing rules. And billing rules then gives you the ability to keep track of what have you drawn down against this customer PO for balance, um, for, for balance tracking some charges that the customer knows, I've agreed to pay you $30,000. Please keep track of that balance for me. I'm going to keep track on my side. The customer PO and agreement balances are something that are easily reported in something called a detail report. 
if you go to the customer POs or agreements, you can include values on the report such as total money used by charges and total money remaining. So you can always get that real-time report based on what you've been doing as far as the invoicing, billing rules, and so forth in the system. One thing you may have noticed as, you, as I was um, uh, going into the multiple invoice creation, there's actually checkboxes that allow you to actually split invoices. So instead of creating one invoice per project, for example, you could create one invoice for the same project but split it across maybe three or four POs that may be funding that invoice. So you can automatically leverage the fact that agreements and customer POs are on a project to split the invoice out altogether. When you do use an invoice, a customer PO on an invoice, it does natively include the customer PO in the invoice header itself. You'll notice that it's not the PO number per se, but it's the description that I called the PO as I was actually developing it in the system. Some people prefer to actually see the PO number, and they don't want to see it in the header. They want to see it associated on the invoice itself next to each of the individual items or rolled up subtotals, and you can certainly do that. You can disable the view of this or the addition of this customer PO in the invoice header itself, but then use the invoice layout as a way to view customer PO numbers and details on the invoice. So if you look in the example that we have in our system, here's an example of where we are actually itemizing information out by phases of a deployment and along with the PO numbers that we're funding each of the items including the expenses. So we just included that actually on the invoice itself for easy reference by the customer. In November of this past year, uh, there was a release that actually added a new feature which I found very helpful and I wanted to make sure I included it in this presentation. And it's a way to look at the customer PO balances directly from the invoice as you're generating it and even after you've generated it instead of having to go into the detail report and running a regular report to kind of view the, that balance. Um, if you're not aware of it, it's an internal switch. And what it allows you to do is if any customer has a PO associated with it, it will display the customer PO balance as the invoice is being generated, as the example here, which is a 3M workday demo. Uh, it was a single invoice that I'm generating, but right away it shows me that I have a balance of $53 from a $55 PO if I generate the invoice for this $2 charge. After generation, you're always welcome to open up the invoice again, and it will have a floating window that continually keeps track of what the current balance is. Not the current balance according to this invoice, just the current balance across all of the invoices that may have drawn down against the PO, and what the current balance is uh, against this customer. So you always have a running total, and it's very obvious as you're working with the system. So if I go into an example in the system, you can see how this one um, was overdrawn, but the customer was okay with it. They just needed reference information. If I go into one of these customer examples here, you'll see that there's only $2.50 left on this um, PO that won't cover a cup of coffee at, at Starbucks in many cases. So it, this is an opportunity to reach out to the customer and say, hey, I just want to let you know that we're running out of funding. You probably already know that but you know, let us know if you want to continue, reissue, refill, whatever you'd like to do. In January of this year, just last month, there was um, quite a bit of new features related to the customer PO, not so much the agreement, but the customer PO themselves um, that uh, are making everyone's life a lot easier as they work with the customer PO functionality in OpenAir. And one of them is the fact that you can actually, once you've got the customer PO linked to the projects, and um, or created in the system and linked to the projects, you can actually go and view and modify those customer POs directly from the project. Um, for those of you who are using customer POs right now, it's automatically in the system. You just may not have even noticed it yet. Um, go into your financials menu and you'll see customer POs as a drop down there if a PO is associated to the project. Once you're in there, you just look at the invoices, uh, the customer POs um, as a normal activity. So let's go to projects. I'll show you this example. Take this, go to financials, customer POs. And here's the POs. I can open them up, take a look at them, make some modifications to them. 
And it's just like going into the administration module or the account module like you've had to do up until January of this year. January also included, which is an internal switch, the ability to actually track hours on the PO. Now this functionality isn't fully built out yet, but it's the start of something great. So many of you have asked to be able to track hours, not so much money on a PO, and this does um, start that trend in the system. And what it supports is the ability to actually um, uh, deal with caps on uh, billing as it relates to hours in the system. So um, definitely some, uh, some great advancements with the customer PO functionality in January. Um, and if you're not able to take the time to evaluate these releases, please let us know. We've got a release management campaign going on right now, which is an offering we do, very low price, where we help you evaluate your features every release. Um, the, the price is $1,500 until the end of um, February. Um, that will expire and the price will increase. And we cover every release in 2012 and give you a document of recommendations which looks something similar to this recommendations report. And we go through and explain to you the limitations of the feature, how it works, any dependencies we found, and of course anything that we've been a already reported to OpenAir that they may be working on right now. So uh, definitely a, a time saver and something to consider. Uh, as we continue on with the webinar. So let's talk about handling credits. Um, so we've got the invoicing. We know how to generate the invoices. We know how to use the PO functionality and leveraging some of these new features as far as POs are concerned. Um, but cr handling credits, um, there's really four ways to do this. Um, there's a way you basically create a negative charge and apply it to an existing invoice. Of course, you have to know that the invoice can be modified at that point before you can create the charge. Um, you can create a negative charge and issue a whole other invoice, what's called a credit notice or a credit memo, for example. You can enter a credit amount on an existing invoice, which is a standard feature on the header of the invoice uh, itself. And you can actually credit an entire invoice for potential rebilling, which is the credit rebill functionality released last uh, July. So what's the best way for you to handle credits in the system? And that is a hard question to answer because there's a lot of other questions that come up. So you know, can you edit an invoice after you've created it? If you can, then it's going to be as easy to add a credit charge or a negative charge. Um, but if you're interfacing with another system, it may already be exported, and so you really shouldn't muck around with that uh, invoice because the, it will start to mismatch the system it just handed over to. So you may be stuck in a, in a mode where you have to create a credit memo or a credit invoice in OpenAir to talk to your other system. Other things to consider are things actually not so much related to finance, but how the business is running, and that things like employee billable utilization. What if uh, the company has decided that they're going to credit this customer $2,000, which is the equivalent of an eight-hour day? Um, for somebody who did work, maybe there was a customer complaint or something, do you still give that, that employee eight hours of billable credit or do you reduce that as well? So how you do the, the credit is important here because do you negate out the hours or do you just credit the money amount to the customer and still give the employee credit? No right answer to that question. It's completely dependent on your policies within your organization. If you are integrated with an accounting system, how can the accounting system understand what a credit is? Um, some accounting systems like an SAP, if you go to credit hours, you cannot say negative eight hours at $100 an hour. You have to say eight hours at negative $100 an hour. A system like SAP does not understand the term negative hours. That doesn't make any sense to it. So you may have to create manual charges in a unique way to be able to interface with your accounting system if you have the systems connected. And the other um, potential concept is um, what if you have a currency rate exchange? So you invoiced at um, 100 US dollars, they paid you in uh, euros, which actually when you cashed the check, the check came out to be $98. So you're probably just going to write off that $2 and just credit off the invoice so that there isn't a $2 AR balance out there that you're tracking for aging. So if you're, uh, if you're doing an integrated system, you tend to have to issue a credit notice or a credit invoice itself. And you can do that in OpenAir. It's basically just creating an invoice, but the charges are all negative. And if you really want it to, to be customer-facing, you can actually create an invoice layout dedicated to credits. Um, 
with the invoice title of credit notice or credit memo. And so instead of saying invoice in the upper right-hand corner, it'll say credit notice. Um, if you know about the credit as you're generating the invoice, of course, that's always uh, the optimal time because then you can add the credit into the existing invoice and not have to worry about creating credit memos uh, along the way. But why would you use this credit field on the, on the invoice header? I get this question a lot. And there actually is a great example of why you would use this credit memo. Um, this credit field, um, the, the limitations of the credit field is it just reduces the amount of money that's due on the invoice from the client. Now the credit has, as you can see, as you put a money amount in here, it has no understanding of things like charge stage or customer PO relationship or services. It doesn't impact anything regarding um, the value of reporting. It really is just an outstanding balance control on the invoice. So why would you use it? When would you use it? Oh, and if you're not familiar with where I am now when I'm showing these screenshots, I'm actually inside an invoice. And if you edit the invoice header, you'll see that there's always this credit and reason for credit field. So here's a great example that, uh, that we had come up with here at, at TopStep as to why to use this credit field. So, Oops. An example is I invoiced the customer number 123 and it was valued at $50,000. But then I issued, it was interfaced with another system, so when I, in, I issued a credit, we overcharged them, I uh, issued a credit of negative $5,000. So I created a credit memo, but that credit memo number was 145. So the customer pays $45,000 because, of course, if you add the two together, it's $45,000, and I record that payment against the invoice number 123, which then leaves me a $5,000 balance on the open air invoice 123. It's going to age that invoice saying there's still money due, there's still money due, there's still money due, because the balance is not zero yet. The outstanding balance is not zero. But I know I don't have to worry about it because basically credit memo 145 and the remaining balance on invoice 123 cancel each other out. Of course, there's no payment according to 145. It's a credit, and the customer wouldn't ask for a check back or something like that. So what you can do is you can go into that credit field in the header of the invoice, and on 123, put a credit of $5,000. And this will actually zero out the balance of what's due on the invoice. On the credit memo, put a negative $5,000, which will zero out the balance on that invoice. When you're doing reporting against this situation with the projects and the charges, the charges automatically cancel themselves out because value-wise, um, the $5,000 and the negative $5,000 along with the payment is going to um, make everything come back to $45,000, which is supposed to be. So really the credit was really just something to clean up the invoice balances and not have to impact anything else financially in the system. So that's a great example of when you would use that credit field. Otherwise, the charges are, are a better way to go. But a feature that just came out in last July um, was a way to actually quickly create a credit, a credit and a rebill opportunity in open air. And really, it's the quick way to create credit memos. So I want to go through this, because it's something that you can have activated by open air support. And um, it avoids the extra steps that you may have to do to create multiple charges that generate a credit memo. So when you turn this feature on, it gives you a tab called Credit Rebill in the Invoices module. So you can see here, Open, Submitted, Approved, Unpaid, all in this Credit Rebill shows up. You also get one more option on the Invoice Layout. It says Default Credit Invoice Layout. Okay, so you can create an invoice with the, with the title of you know, credit memo, and tag it as the default credit invoice layout. The reason is, as you generate an invoice, if that invoice needs to be credited, it's already approved, for example, or gone over to um, an, an accounting system, you can credit that invoice, create a, an entire credit memo, charge for charge, by simply clicking on a new link that will appear that says Credit Rebill. When you click on Credit Rebill, you get a reason for credit, so you can explain what you're doing or why you have to credit this out. And then you can also have it automatically approve, or you can submit it, of course, for review and approval. And then you just click the credit button. When you do that, your screen refreshes and it comes back and it says, I've created a new invoice, 842 in this example, and this is your credit invoice. 
and it has all of the charges mirrored one for one, but they're all negative. So it basically creates an entire credit memo with a negative balance for that, um, that invoice. What it also does is it frees up the charges that were on the original invoice so that you can um, make adjustments to these credits and understand how you're going to deal with credits um, in the system. This credit memo is automatically approved. I can go ahead and decide that I want to modify this credit memo to move items saying, okay, I'm not going to credit the whole thing. I'm just going to credit you know, eight, ten charges, which may be um, expenses. Maybe we're writing off the expenses. So I'm going to credit the whole memo. I'm going to remove all of the uh, expenses from an invoice. And then I can actually move those, char those items into something like, um, like a non-invoiceable or a write-off stage. So I can move those charges into a write-off stage. Once I've done that, now I can go back to that original invoice and just hit rebill. And when I have the rebill option, I basically reset the invoice back to the billing activity. So we're going to walk through that this whole function so you can see how it works. So I'm going to go to an existing invoice. Well, this is a good one. I'm going to do a credit on invoice 253 for information. I create the credit. So now this invoice, 847, is my credit invoice. If I go and look at the details of that invoice, I just click through it. I have the ability to change charges, and here's all the details, and you'll notice every single thing has got a negative value on it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say basically we're writing out anything that had to do with contract review. So I'm removing those. If I go into open, the client was information. Here's the two charges that I wrote off. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move those to my non-invoiceable stage. I'm going to write those charges off. Of course, as I'm doing this, I'm realizing I'm doing it in completely the reverse, <laughs> completely the reverse section. What I actually want to do is I'm going to I'm going to write off the planning activity. Sorry about that. I'm going to write off the planning activity, so I'm going to credit this information out so that uh, we're picking up the tab for the planning activity. So this is what's going to get credited, the negative 375. This is an invoice that can be emailed to the customer to say, hey, I'm crediting all this information for you on uh, on this invoice. Okay. So I've got that um, invoice credited, and now I'm going to go back to my credit rebuild tab and take a view at the original invoice. If I click on Credit Rebill, here's what my, um, my credit invoice looks like now. I've adjusted it, so I've moved off things that I'm not going to credit. And uh, the 375 is what the customer will see as a credit invoice. Now I can actually reset this invoice 253 back to its original state by just hitting Rebill. And the entire invoice is back as a whole invoice as the customer saw it before. So basically what it allows you to do is it allows you to take an invoice that already exists, automatically create all the negative detailed charges, and then you can decide which of those charges stay on the credit memo that you can send to the customer. So instead of having to create manual charges, you can have it, the system do it automatically for you and then reset the original, re reset the original invoice. So it is a time savings um, action, um, but there are some cons. So when you create a credit invoice, you can't delete that credit invoice like you can with the manual approach, the manual charge approach. And if you happen to, even though I moved charges around, if I deleted any of those charges, I would have to manually recreate them because running the billing rules won't do anything. The charge technically still exists in the system. So it's a little bit confusing if you had to, if you sort of start deleting stuff or want to delete stuff. Um, but otherwise, it is a quick way to create a credit memo in the open air system. And the last topic before I open it up for questions is um, just to make you aware that if you uh, open air does have a, a lot of variety in how it can um, customize the invoice layout. And uh, that's a whole other discussion, and we have a webinar on that already. So there's lots of options that may make the invoices in open air more appealing or attractive to send to a customer. But something that um, you may consider is also the fact that you can email the invoice to a customer in open air doesn't sound that exciting, but there is an option that um, I think um, is useful for a lot of people in the fact that if you click on the email invoice option, you email the um, 
invoice electronically to the customer, it automatically sets the um, sent status, the status on the invoice to sent so that you know you sent it. If the customer clicks on it or when they click on it to open up the link, OpenAir will automatically change that to viewed so you know the customer has received the email and you know that somebody's opened it up. Um, who's the somebody that's going to open it up and who gets the email? That actually is, of course, the two line which you can type in the email address, but you can also associate billing contacts to a project or an invoice which automatically populate that email address, another time saving so you don't have to keep looking this kind of stuff up. And of course, you have a text field when you go to generate the invoice that you can put anything in there. Hello, this is our final invoice. Um, how would you like to you know, renew the contract? Hey, your customer PO balance is a little low. What would you like to do? So you can type anything you want in here, and it would be included in the email that the customer gets automatically. But I think one of the more powerful options um, are things like you can attach the docu a document to the email and the customer can see the document through the email. So you don't have to download the, the open air invoice, download the attachments, every, send everything in one big email. You can actually attach a document directly in open air's um, email, uh, invoice itself. It's the edit invoice form. If you do an attachment, then you can, um, when you go to email the uh, invoice, you get the option to include an attachment before you actually hit the send button and the document will follow that email. And last but not least is this history link. And this is something that um, I definitely find a big benefit for. So what happens is when you do send the invoice out, it's time stamps in this history of events, when it's sent and who sent it. And when the customer it keeps track of who was emailed as far as the customer recipient, and then it also see, shows you when the customer opened it up. Um, and then if you have to do repeated reminders, maybe overdue notices, it would keep track of all that as well. So you have a nice email history that you don't have to keep like in an outbox or something like that or on a piece of paper or a sticky note. So the system has this history link automatically available um, as you send emails to the customer. So we'll open up the lines now. But in summary, just understand, I think you've seen from this um, short webinar that invoicing is actually a pretty complicated activity, but there's lots of features functionalities that can cost, uh, cut time and cost as you're doing invoicing in open air to make your life a little bit easier. Uh, also, if you're doing some kind of, if you're trying to figure out how best to do crediting, think about the integrations you may have already with the open air system. And, and definitely, you know, if you want to be green, I guess the email function in open air is a great way to go because you save paper and postage, which um, in today's world is a, is, a, is a great advantage. Well, I'd like to thank you all for joining us uh, again on these webinar series. Uh, if you'd like to know more information or if you have any other questions, um, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, you can reach me at info at topstepconsulting.com. Of course, we have our website where we post all of these recorded webinars. We do send out uh, Twitter tweets every now and then on Top Step Tweets. And, we are uh, actively uh, engaged in the open air users community within the LinkedIn group, so we definitely look forward to interacting with you there. And if you'd like to look into the release management offering that we have until the end of this month, please definitely don't hesitate to contact me about more information. So thank you very much for attending.